Can a mere lamb rise to challenge gods themselves in just 100 days? Today, we're putting that question to the test. With my cult by my side and my resolve as sharp as a sword, we're confronting the false bishops that rule this twisted land. As we unearth hidden secrets and face off against divine entities, we're not just fighting for survival, we're battling for ultimate victory. So brace yourselves for an epic journey. We're about to conquer Cult of the Lambs in just 100 days. Right out of the gate, I find myself with an axe hovering above my neck. Talk about a warm welcome. Luckily, a god of death with a knack for charity steps in to lend a hand. The catch? All I've got to do is start a cult in his name, which, let's be real, was not exactly a take-it-or-leave-it kind of deal. I mean, what's a newly executed lamb to do, right? After dealing with some minions, I crossed paths with someone named Ratu. Turns out he used to be the chosen one like yours truly, but now he's taken a career in being vaguely helpful, advising me to just keep on moving ahead. Not sure what I'd do without you, Ratu. Thank you. Deep in the woods, I stumble upon another sacrificial ceremony, because apparently that's the local pastime around here. I get a hot tip that if I play the hero and save this guy, he might join my cult, and that's a free follower. Finally, the force spits me out and I'm faced with choosing a difficulty level. Of course, I go for extra hard because, well, extra hard is my middle name. Back at my cult headquarters, I bump into Theon, a charmingly naive donkey plagued with the fears of death. With no time to waste, I got him chopping wood, because in this cult, everyone has to pull their own weight. Next, it's my turn to flex my own muscles and do all lumberjack, scavenging for wood and stone and creating a rudimentary cooking fire. Seems like I'm going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting around here, but hey, who's complaining? It's time to set out on my crusade with my sights set firmly on Leshy. Equipped with my trusty sword and a heavy dose of determination, I plunge back into the depths of the forest. Upon meeting a cheeky tablet that implores me to follow the old faith, I swiftly give it the boot. Let's be clear, we don't take kindly to fear tactics around here. In my endeavors, I discover a skull necklace, a fashionable yet practical accessory that apparently doubles the life expectancy of my followers. Useful. My path crosses with Klonak, who introduces me to the wild world of tarot cards. Each card comes with a unique perk, whether it's boosting my damage or health, or giving me a flashy new ability like detonating a bomb with a simple roll. Neat stuff. The game then takes me on tour of the dungeon layout, presenting me with the option of choosing my own route. I can collect rocks or stock up on food. I opt for the food because, hey, a lamb's gotta eat. It's time for a face-to-face -face meeting with the formidable Leshy himself. He tries to puff up his chest, warning me that he's stronger and advising me to run for the hills, but I don't back down. This leads me to squaring off against Amduzius, one of Leshy's minion pals supercharged with his own blood. Surprisingly, not as tough as he looks. Defeating him reveals Leshy's door with a single lit notch. A hint, perhaps? I'll need to navigate this dungeon four times before I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big bad Leshy himself. Game on, folks. Straight off, it seems my cult has a new recruit. Amduzius himself. Yeah, the guy I just pummeled. He's even lending a hand to building the monument in our cute little cult compound. This unlocks what they call Divine Inspirations, upgrades to my cult that include unlocking buildings and other fun stuff. Next, I whip up a temple because nothing says cult quite like a good sermon spot. I deliver my first sermon. Thanks for showing up, folks. Sermons, it turns out, let me develop another skill tree. I unlock parts of the faith, which nabs me an extra half heart. Handy stuff when you're on extra heart. I jump back into the woods to clear a path to the not so lovable Leshy. Found an axe this time, way better than a sword, in my opinion. In the middle of my whittling romp, I bump into Ratu. He hooks me up with the ability to shoot arrows, super helpful. Though these things take fervor, which I can recharge by knocking enemies about. Meanwhile, I stumble upon a chicken named Noir. It seems he's wiped out his entire village. I've got the choice to forgive his foul deeds or guilt trip him. I tried the guilt trip route, thinking he would pull a fast one on me, but he told me to scram. I'll let him stew for a while, we'll let him over eventually. Hot on Noir's trail, I meet Haro. He introduces me to Commandments, where I can play God and set my own doctrines for my cult. The possibilities are endless. Then, I lock horns with another one of Leshy's minions, Balafar. Gotta admit, this guy gave me a solid fight. Thankfully, I took him down and lay another notch on Leshy's door. The God of Death even gave me a quick visit, patting me on the head and saying I'm doing a good job. Always nice to get a thumbs up from the boss. I'm back at the cult compound and ready to try out this new command. With it, I unlock a bonfire ritual. It's like a massive group therapy session where everyone's faith level skyrockets. 
Speaking of faith, that's one of the many plates I have to keep spinning here. Faith, hunger, and health. You know, typical cult management stuff. I noticed my loyal followers were snoozing on the cold hard ground, not on my watch. Unlocked some comfy sleeping bags for them. Man of the people, that's me. Now that the domestic stuff is sorted out, time to head back to the battlefield. This time I'm greeted with a dagger, and oddly, the power to summon tentacles. Not what I was expecting, but hey, I'm not one to complain about bonus features. I bump into Ratu again in the forest. Dude must have a GPS tracker on me. It gives me a challenge. Complete a few combat rooms without dodging and I'll get a reward. Yeah, right. Like, that's gonna happen. I mean, with the level of environmental traps around here, I'd be a kebab in no time without dodging. Get real. Oh, look who it is again, Leshy. This time, he brought his buddies along. They don't look so tough. I face off against the next mini boss, Barbatos, a burrowing worm that's got nothing on me, and another notch on the Leshy door. Back at the cold compound, I'm gifted with the neat ability from the boss upstairs. Mind reading. Now that's gonna come in handy. I also unlock Bane weapons, which let me find poison weapons on my crusades. To celebrate, I host a bonfire ritual inside my sanctum. Not the best idea in terms of fire safety, but it did the trick. It's at this point I unlock the ability to grant daily blessings, a little pick-me-up to boost their faith. The more devoted they are, the more goodies I get, so I whip up a meal for everyone. Mid-chat with my buddy Theon, I see one of my followers drop a gift on the floor behind me. Very classy. I also unlock the body pit because, you know, cool life can be unpredictable, and who knows what could happen to a follower who can't find a bathroom. Next on the agenda, I use another commandment to unlock the Ritual Fast. My followers can now go on a three-day hunger strike without failing a thing. Nice trick if we ever run out of snacks. Then it's off to the lonely shack to find Ratu. He set up a little dice game called Knuckle Bones. Looks simple enough. Match my dice number and destroy my opponents by matching theirs. Easy, right? Uh, okay, just a bit of bad luck. Round two, here I go. Alright, so maybe Knuckle Bones is Ratu's superpower, but third time's a charm and I finally win, scoring a new tarot card with an extra heart. Time for the main event, Leshy. I walk back into the forest, poised axe in hand and murder on my mind. I stumble across a spider named Helob, who's got a follower for sale. I figure, why not, I'll save this guy. And then I meet this particular fellow named The Fisherman. He looks like a trout wearing a fake nose. I can't help but think he's a real fish out of water in this place. This is where I take a bit of a tumble and get martyred, but no worries, the big man upstairs gives me a free pass back to the living. Unfortunately, my follower's faith in me takes a hit. Time for some damage control. First, I unlock Maya the Devout One to beef up the starting level of my weapons for my crusades. I also upgrade my temple and shrine, making a more popular spot for prayers and devotion collection. I unlock the Grass Eater Tree Doctrine. Now my cult members won't lose faith if they have to eat grass. Handy, considering the stuff's everywhere. I go on to unlock the Lumber Yard, passing out some gifts, and get the Stone Yard going. All in a day's work for a cult leader. Always gotta be prepared. So I'm off to the next stop on my tour, Pilgrim's Passage. It's got this quaint little lighthouse by the beach, kinda cozy. It's also where I unlock a new follower form, crucial if I want to ace this game 100%. I come across a jittery lighthouse keeper who's lost his leader and is feeling all adrift. How do I win him over? Just toss some wood on the fire and light his lighthouse right back up. Just like that, he's Team Lamb. Oh look, it's our fishy friend again, the fisherman. He's got a task for me. Catch four rare fish, get a gift. Sounds fair to me. The mini game is a piece of cake. I even bag another tarot card. But my luck with fishing? Let's just say the fish aren't biting. I decided to stop by the local shop to grab some more tarot cards. Got one that lets me shoot projectiles with my attacks, one for extra harvesting resources, another 20% more damage during daylight, and a surprise friendly bomb for when I get hit. All handy additions for my arsenal. Having gathered more resources and caught up on some Shut-Eye, Dawn breaks and it's fishing time again. No surprise, it's another fish-free day. No rare fish to show for all the bait that I've dangled. Talk about getting on my last nerve. I channel my inner god of death and decide to take my irritation out on Leshy. No creature is safe from my vengeance, not even this innocent squirrel. Or this other one, which was hoarding yet another follower form. Eventually, splattered with the blood of my foes, I reach Leshy's abode. Let's just say his welcome was less than warm. 
He starts to get a bit tricky when he summons his horde of jumping caterpillars, but he's no match for my bottled up rage. After his defeat and subsequent heart extraction, one of the chains binding our god of death snaps. So the real reason Mr. Death is lending me a hand is because he's in bishop jail, and every bishop I take down is a step closer to his freedom. This just got a bit more complicated. Back at Cold HQ, everyone is overwhelmed by my accomplishment. Just look at them, walking away before I even have a chance to showcase the heart. Valifar was so wowed, he wanted me to whip up a grass meal to commemorate the occasion. Well, whatever floats his boat. Running on the devotion ways for my cult's recent upgrades, I managed to unlock Kudai's Blessing. This lets me call back a weapon or curse, albeit at a slightly reduced level. It's like returning a bad purchase, handy when I roll an absolute dud of a weapon. Another doctrine gets unlocked too, and it's a fisherman's dream. With the ritual of the ocean's bounty, my fishing luck goes through the roof. I think double the fish and a greater chance for special ones biting. It's like having my own personal fish magnet. Part of a bishop in hand, darkness within gets unlocked next. It starts me off with a diseased heart each crusade run. It sounds gross, but when damaged, it's a room clearing bomb. I mean, who doesn't love a good health boost, especially when playing on extra hard? Wrapped up by my new doctrine, I performed a quick fishing ritual and make a beeline for the docks. My day is all about fish. Finally, with enough rare fish to my name, I get the promised reward. And let me tell you, it's an absolute game changer. These amulets unlock a new fleece, the golden fleece no less. It's like a kill counter, upping my damage by 5% with each enemy I take down. But the catch? Any damage taken resets the counter and doubles the pain. So basically, it's a game of don't get hit and win. Piece of cake, right? Before I face the storm, I pick up another half-heart upgrade. Just a precaution. I doubt I'll need it. I also get my hands on the Substances and Courage trait, which gives me a faith boost when I perform a brainwashing ritual. Not quite sure what it entails, but hey, it sounds useful. With all these new powers, I'm ready to take on a new land, Anura, and to top it all off, I've got a shiny new weapon, the Gauntlet. It's go time. In this fresh terrain, I meet Rakshasa, a rainbow caterpillar of sorts offering the finest ingredients from across the realms. Sounds good to me. In a moment of curiosity, I decided to smack the snail behind him. It turns out that's his sweetheart. Oops, my bad. This new region, however, isn't quite familiar to me, especially the enemy patterns. A bouncing frog quickly brings about my downfall. Well, that was unexpected. Back at the cult, I unlock the refinery. This handy addition lets me upgrade basic resources like wood and stone into more potent forms, like logs and bricks to be specific. These will come in handy when we start getting into the more advanced construction projects, so I promptly set them up. Theon, my first follower, somehow believes it's my responsibility to pick up waste around the place. Sure, why not, just another day in cult life. But in my cleanup drive, I missed one. Well, I'll grab it next time. As I step out, I notice heal up with a man on his spider web. My hero instincts kick in, and I decide to save the poor chap, even if it means buying him off the spider. Welcome, new follower. It's back to the land of Hecate for me, but Hecate, in an act of cruel magic, makes Theon starve. Note to self, whip up something for Theon when I return. Here, I meet Kudai, a generous chap who gives me weapons and spells every time I run into him. A good ally to have. This time, I nail it. I charge through the land without taking a single hit, racking up a whopping 245% bonus damage. Gusian, you're going down. Well, Gusian does manage to half my health which cuts my damage down significantly. But that's not going to save him. It just drags out the inevitable. After triumphing over Goosey and recruiting him into my cult, I unlocked a notch on Hecate's door, a sweet victory token. Back to my folks now, mission accomplished. Before I can rejoin my followers, the chain god gives me a new ritual, the capability to sacrifice people. Now, this is supposed to enhance my strength and unlock new abilities and weapons, but let me make one thing crystal clear. Although I'm a cult leader, it doesn't mean that I regard my followers as mere pawns to be manipulated and used. Far from it. Each one of them is part of this cult not because I exerted some divine or mystical influence over them, but because they believe in me. They chose to stand by me, to support me in this challenging endeavor, to share in the glory and tribulations that come with it. These followers of mine, they are not mere subjects. They are my comrades, my friends, my family. Each one of them is unique, 
possessing strengths and weaknesses just like me, just like every living creature in this world. And these individual quirks, these distinctive characteristics are what make them invaluable to me, to us. Each of their lives is a precious gem, a testament to the incredible variety and vibrance of life itself. So if you dare to assume that I would sacrifice one of them for a few trivial power-ups or some resources, you couldn't be more mistaken. For each of their lives is a story, a story of courage, dedication, and faith, a story that I'm honored to be a part of. Each follower is an irreplaceable part of this beautiful tapestry we're weaving together. I would never, ever consider tearing that apart for personal gain. Hold on, hold on. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves here. I mean, sacrificing. It sounds bad, right? But let me ponder for a moment. I mean, it's Theon we're talking about. Our buddy, our pal. Remember all those times Theon was like, Oh, mighty leader, I'm not worthy. I'd give my life for you. He, he said that, right? I, I think. He said something like that. Well, he's not really saying anything to the contrary right now, so I'm going to take that as agreement. And let's be honest, Theon would absolutely love this. It's like, it's like getting backstage passes to the great beyond, a front row seat to the mysteries of life and death. And hey, it's not like I'm using for some minor power-ups or a lot of um, resources or anything. It's for the good of the coal. Yes, exactly. It's the greater good we're talking about here. So, all in all, it's not as much of a sacrifice as a, as a promotion. Yeah, a promotion for Theon. I mean, he gets to unlock the heavy attack ability for us. How cool is that? He always loved the idea of unique attacks, so it's a win-win situation, right? Alright, let's do this one. With Theon. <laughs> Also managed to unlock the extort tits follower action, giving me the power to, well, extort my followers for money. Why do I feel like I'm slowly turning into the antagonist here? Nah, whatever. Moving on. I perform a ritual that makes my followers fast for the next three days so they won't need to eat. Okay, I'll admit it, I might be the villain. But a lamb's gotta do what a lamb's gotta do. Back into the fray, I test the heavy attack on the gauntlets. It's a small spinning move that deals damage around me kind of underwhelming, to be honest. Along the way, I meet Chemic, who introduces me to a new category of items called Relics. These artifacts unlock additional, unique abilities that have cooldowns. For example, this relic lets me rain down lightning bolts on the enemies. Although, it comes with a long cooldown. The only way to recharge is by dealing damage to enemies. I'm excited to see what other relics have to offer. As I press on, I encounter friendly mushroom people from a distant northern land. It's definitely worth a visit. Now, I mentioned they were peaceful, but they might be hiding some treasure. And come on, they're probably evil anyway. So I decided to wipe them out and lay waste to their belongings. Yeah, I might have gone a bit too far. The remaining three bishops suddenly ambush me, demanding that I submit to them. Of course, I'm not afraid, so I refuse. They retaliate by turning every room into a battlefield. Great, this is going to be a long haul. At last, I face Elagos, a plump, fast-moving bat. There's gotta be a joke in there somewhere. Unfortunately, his movements were pretty unpredictable, causing me to fall yet again. Bouncing back from that, I decided to dedicate some time to strengthening my cult. After all, a good leader knows that the strength of his cult lies in his followers. To this end, I unlocked the belief in materialism trait. The happiness and faith in their eyes were enough to lift my spirits. Next up, I headed back to the Spore Grotto to unlock four new tarot cards. The first one seemed pretty straightforward, allowing me to turn my rolls into deadly attacks. The second boosted my strength by whopping 30% at night. Vampires ain't got nothing on me. The third increased my movement speed by 25%, making me feel like the wind. And the last one? Well, it made me spawn a tentacle every time I was hit. Kinda weird, right? But hey, who am I to question the ways of the turret? Hidden deep in the grotto, I bump into this weird guy named Sozo. He seems a bit too interested in my mushroom finding abilities, and promised me a reward if I could find him some. And let me tell you, 
There's no faster way to get me to do something than to dangle a shiny reward in front of my face. With my sights set on this new quest, I zipped back to Hecate's land to go on a wild mushroom hunt, hoping to add another notch to his door in the process. I had to swing my new axe around a bit, and trust me, it packs a mean punch. Far more satisfying than those clunky gauntlets. Oh, and did I mention I became a giant? Yeah, this relic I found makes me grow to an incredible size. My mushroom hunt brought me to a campfire while a guy named Bonch was chilling. He made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He could increase the faith of one of my followers. How could I say no? I mean, faith is our currency here. But then, out of nowhere, Gushian shows up again. This guy just doesn't know when to quit, does he? He seems tougher this time around, but I still managed to beat him, even though it cost me all the damage I had stacked up. With a newfound sense of determination, I squared up against Elagos again. I'd finally gotten the hang of his moves, and we ended up in a high-stakes battle of wits and skill. Just as I was about to land the final blow, he managed to pull a faster on me, dashing forward and taking me down. Back to the drawing board. Brimming with disappointment, I decided to unlock necromatic weapons, which have a chance to summon a ghost to fight for me every time I defeat an enemy. I also upgraded to Might of the Devout 2, giving me more powerful weapons at the start of every crusade. Surely, with these new abilities, I would be unstoppable. Or so I thought. Before I knew it, a random frog managed to take me down. Embarrassing, I know. I returned to my cult and took it out on my followers, forcing them to perform the Ritual of Enrichment, handing over all their money to me. As their leader, it was my right, right? Eager to redeem myself, I rushed back into the mushroom forest. However, things quickly took a turn for the worst. Overwhelmed, I realized I needed to slow down, take a breather, and regroup. And what better way to do that than by cooking a bowl of poop for one of my followers? I mean, it's not my preferred method of relaxation, but it is what it is, right? However, watching him get sick after eating it, that was something else. This guy's pretty weird, but hey, at the end of the day, aren't all of us a little weird? On my journey, I ran into a new face, Forneus. This cat, yes, you heard me right, a gigantic talking cat, sold me a new tarot card that boosts my curse attack damage by 25%. Armed with my new card, I was ready to take on Elagos once again, or at least I thought I was, until I was defeated by a random minion. Talk about a reality check. Okay. It's either I'm just having a bad streak of luck, or just maybe, I'm not as good at this game as I thought I was. But hey, before you say anything, there is no way I'm about to lower the difficulty. I may be stubborn, but I didn't sign up for an easy ride. I'm here to overcome challenges, not run from them. The only snag, I am on a deadline. 100 days and the clock is ticking, but I've got this right. Time to dive back in. And once again, I meet my fate at the hands of Elagos. I could almost hear him laughing as I fell. The defeat hit hard, harder than any physical blow. I started to question myself, my abilities. Maybe, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I set the bar too high. Maybe this challenge was too much for me. I found myself at a crossroads, contemplating whether I should swallow my pride and lower the difficulty. Then, a voice in me spoke up. It was quiet at first, almost a whisper, but it grew louder. Louder and more insistent until it drowned out all of my doubts. The voice reminded me that every failure is just a stepping stone towards success. The true victory lies in the number of times you get up, not how often you're knocked down. I realized that I wasn't going to let Elagos define my journey, define me. I had to face this challenge head on, no matter how hard it may seem. After all, it's not about the destination, but the journey, right? And I know my journey is far from over. So here's to never giving up. Here's to rising every time we fall. Here's to the strength within us, the strength persevere. Let's do this. Filling the sting of defeat was a kick in the gut, but I wasn't about to give up. It was time to get some new tools from my arsenal. I unlocked a new commandment, the devotee trait, a small change that would make my daily sermons generate more faith among my followers. Along with that, I scored zealous weapons, which would turn the fervor I collected into a divine inspiration boost. I also constructed a new building that would allow me to turn my followers into demonic allies for battle. Finally, a substantial upgrade for the battlefield. Without wasting any time, I morphed Gusian into a demon. Together, we headed into battle, ready to face whatever came our way. I could feel it. This time, we had a real shot. And guess what? Thanks to my newfound companion and perhaps an uncanny number of diseased hearts I happened upon during the run, Elagos finally met his match. We vanquished him. In recognition of my victory, the God of Death granted me the power to trade surplus items for gold. Perfect, I thought. 
Finally, a place to offload all those fish I caught ages ago. I immediately upgraded the Demon Summoning Circle to summon two more demons for my battles. The added backup should make future crusades a tad easier. One of my followers urged me to establish a lumber and stone yard. With a comfortable surplus of resources, I agreed. So I laid the foundation and left the building task to my followers. I mean, being a co-leader is about delegating work, right? With a renewed sense of hope, I ventured once again into the woods. Heck it, the thorn in my side returned, this time leaving five of my followers starving. How pesky. But despite his annoying interventions, I managed to reach the end. Even better, I defeated Zapar on my first try. Things were looking up. Heck it, watch out, because you're next. Returning to my cult, I saw the havoc wrecked by Hecate. My followers were starving. I hastily cooked meals for everyone, although I did burn one in the rush. Not my proudest culinary moment, but it is what it is. To help remedy the situation, I unlocked the Faithful Tree, a perk that accelerated devotion generation by 15%. The faster we grow in faith, the stronger we become. The daily grind in the cult was starting to show some repetitive patterns. My followers and I, we were all part of the same flow, and I was growing tired of picking up the, well, less savory duties. That was when I finally committed to an outhouse, a decision that drastically improved my quality of life. <laughs> Around the same time, two mysterious quests came to my attention. Kudai's Relic and Klonex Relic. Where they came from are beyond me. Fortuitously, I managed to complete Klonex quest, discovering a hidden relic tucked behind the lighthouse. Trust me, I found it through pure instinct. No guides involved. This relic, as it turns out, fires three projectiles from each tarot card in my arsenal, useful for when my tarot collection reaches its peak. Next, I executed the perfect blessing. Simultaneously bestowing grace upon all of my followers as they left the church was like conducting a symphony of faith. Behold the essence of optimal gaming. Feeling invincible, I declared it was time to challenge Hecate. His taunting invitation to meet him at a sanctum stirred my determination. On my journey, I crossed paths with Flinky, a friendly snake who suggested a game of knuckle bones with a lonely shack. As an advocate for challenges, I was thrilled to participate. As I ventured further towards Hecate, I managed to deflect an enemy's arrow back at them, and I'll admit, I was as surprised as you are, who even knew that was possible. But it felt pretty awesome. And th this triumphant moment, however, was short-lived when Hecate introduced me to his colossal frog bodyguards. Oof. Battered but not broken, I returned to the Cole and unlocked the Inspire Doctrine, aimed to boost the loyalty gained from my blessings. Given the frequency of my blessings, it seemed like a sound strategy. My next encounter with Hecate, however, didn't go quite as planned. I was bested not once, but twice by standard mobs. Was this a sign that the Golden Fleece strategy wasn't going to cut it? No, I decided it was a sign I needed to power up. So my new plan was to focus on leveling up my followers' devotion to unlock more potent abilities quickly. I continued to purchase followers from Helob. For my next upgrade, I decided to give Curse of the Horde a try, introducing three new curses into my crusades. Now, I'll confess, I'd been avoiding the curse tree in the past, preferring the straightforward hack and slash approach, but pro progress demanded some compromise. The real kicker though was my burning desire to perform another sacrifice. The boon of points it generated was so tempting, but alas, the cooldown was still in effect. Patience, my friend. Patience. Having amassed sufficient mushrooms, Sozo was able to instruct me in the ways of brainwashing. This assured faith in me would remain at its peak for two days, invaluable during periods of doubt or when playing sacrifices I might usually shake their faith. In a further bout of progress, I acquired the Ritual of Enlightenment, boosting devotion generation by 20% for three days. The alternative instant construction of all current structures seemed unnecessary given the relative quickness of building times. Well prepared, I was ready to face Hecate once more. I had procured a potent relic that would allow me to freeze time momentarily. A newfound ability to purchase extra tarot cards from Klonic only boosted my confidence. Alas, my strength waned in the chambers that preceded Hecate, but I entered the battlefield undeterred. Despite my lack of knowledge regarding Hecate's attacks, I persisted, learning from each swift strike he dealt. I knew victory was only a matter of time. Next, I unlocked Curse of the Occultist, adding three new curses to my arsenal. 
These, I hoped, would prove more efficient than those I'd previously encountered. With food stocks low, I used ample grass to prepare some meals. The dilemma of scarcity would await. Heck, it was a priority. Entering this battle, I was in my prime condition. Boosted weapon damage, full health, and an active tarot card to amplify my damage during the night. Hecate's defeat was imminent. Despite sustaining an injury midway through, I dispatched his lower minions to ramp up my damage output and claim victory. With two bishops down and two more to go, morale was high. In honor of the achievement, I, I activated another doctrine, Glory Through Toil Ritual. This ensured my followers industriousness over three uninterrupted days and nights. The cooldown for my sacrifice ritual finally expired, and I opted to offer Emdusius. At the ripe age of 45, his sacrifice not only yielded the most faith, but also spared him the slow decay of time. Through this, I secured Might of the Devout Three, enhancing my starting levels even further. Furthermore, I used Hecate's Heart to unlock Resurrection, which would allow me to sacrifice a follower and revive once during a crusade. A valuable advantage for when a boss fight gets a little too close for comfort. My next target was in the realm of Anchor Deep, the domain of Calamar. My arsenal was enriched with a new weapon, a hammer. A behemoth in terms of damage, its long wind-up time made it a challenge to wield against nimble foes. But with such high base damage, my Golden Fleece was supercharged. As long as I kept my kill streak intact, the foes would be felled with one fell swoop, transforming my crusades into a walk in the park. Ratu made another appearance, daring me to traverse the next combat rooms without using any curses. No sweat. I hardly ever rely on curses in the first place. Successfully completing this challenge, I was rewarded with a new tarot card, Consecrated Oil. This card had the benefit of recharging relics 25% faster. The interesting inhabitants of Anchor Deep, jellyfish-like creatures, turned out to be a boon. They were like walking dynamite sticks, exploding with a single strike and contributing to the Golden Fleece's damage stacks. With rooms teeming with these creatures, my journey through Anchor Deep seemed more than manageable. My encounter with Calamar was brief and led to the sudden illness of Barbados. Without a medbay at my disposal, this was a worrisome development. Undeterred, I pressed on, scoring off against the mini-boss Salios. Regrettably, our fight was short-lived. Opting for a tactical defeat, I sacrificed one of my elderly followers to observe Salios' attack patterns, although I was quickly overcome once more. On my return to camp, Thetty was in a pitiful state, sprawled on the ground, sick. Clearly, disease was spreading among my followers. I decided to procrastinate dealing with this issue, reassuring myself it would resolve itself. Faced with the looming food crisis, I performed a ritual that staved off hunger for three days. Sensing that my follower count would dwindle soon, I preemptively recruited another. My rematch with Salios was brutal, with my poor dodging skills leaving me at the mercy of his relentless attacks. Despite the rocky start, my confidence surged as I honed my timing, prompting me to gamble another follower's life for a second chance. And this gamble paid off. I managed to anticipate all of Salios' attacks, vanquishing him in the end. One mini-boss down, two more to go before Calamar. Returning to camp, I promptly promoted my cult to Cult 3. Amidst this, Valifar's lifeless body was an alarming sight. The poor fellow had succumbed to old age. While preparing a burial pit for him, a much needed measure given the existing health crisis and the sight of him making others sick, I mistakenly butchered his body. An unfortunate error indeed. That didn't sit well with the rest of the cult. To soothe the ruffled feathers, I unlocked the belief in sacrifice trait, altering my followers' perception of sacrifices from a tragedy to a cause for celebration. Given my frequency of using sacrifices, this felt rather apt. I also unlocked merciless weapons, endowing my weapons with a chance for critical hits. With a fully charged Golden Fleece, this could potentially enable me to topple bosses in only a couple of strikes. A tantalizing prospect. Realizing that my cult survival depended on sustenance, I made the brilliant decision to construct a farm. I mean, who needs divine intervention when you've got agriculture, right? Considering a quarter of my devotees were down with a sickness, faith was on the decline. But hey, nothing a little rest won't fix. I got ambitious and erected two wooden farms and two stone farms as well. Go forth, my followers, and bring me resources aplenty. Now, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, but it seems I forgot to hit the record button during one of my mini boss fights. But trust me, you didn't miss much. I walked in there and just pulverized that boss into dust. But anyway. 
Proud of my little cult of industrious workers, I turned my attention back to my crusade. Here's where things got interesting. Calamar, a supposed bishop, pleaded with me for mercy. I tell you, the nerve of this guy. Wanted me to skip him and go straight to Bishop Shimura instead. Not happening, buddy. You can run, but you can't hide. Now folks, let's pause for a moment and appreciate the magnificence of the Golden Fleece. Watch as I waltz into a room with zero bonus damage and emerge with a whopping 50% damage boost. The sheer power of the fleece in an area packed with easily killable creatures was something else. Sadly, my moment of triumph was cut short when I stepped into the next room and was brutally beat, for all in the span of a few seconds. These summoned minions, they sure pack a punch. The takeaway? Roll out before they spawn. Live and learn, right? Not one to dwell on past mistakes, I plunged back into the fray, and lo and behold, I stumbled upon my first Rainbow Tarot card. It was for the Divine Curse card, reducing fervor consumption by 75% instead of 25% when casting curses. Handy for a frequent curse user, which, ahem, I am not. But hey, it's a Rainbow card. You don't just ignore a Rainbow card. Next, I bumped into a fellow named Plimbo. Seems legit, right? He extended an invitation to his shop in Smuggler's Sanctuary. Sounds a little shady, but my curiosity got the better of me. My next challenge came in the form of a combat room housing a powered up version of my previous nemesis. Time to put my learning to the test. After a lengthy and adrenaline pumping fight, I stood victorious, having not taken a single hit. Finally, I squared off against Balzabub, who transformed our duel into a bullet hell nightmare. One follower was sacrificed in this battle, but let's be real, he was practically knocking on Heaven's door anyway. Victory was mine, paving the way for a face-off with Calamar, and trust me, I had no intention of pulling my punches. With the spot open in my roster post-sacrifice, I quickly recruited another devout follower from Helob. My divine pursuits had borne fruit in the form of the resurrection ritual. It's like recycling for followers. I could sacrifice them, get all the benefits, and then bring them back for round two. I unlocked the Curse of the Tundra next which could potentially be a game changer, giving me icy curses that would slow enemies to a crawl. Now we're talking, folks. Meanwhile, Plimbo, my new sketchy best friend, had a business proposition. Witnesses, monstrous creatures, were cropping up in areas where I had felt the bishops. If I took these critters down and brought their eyes to Plimbo, he'd reward me with amulets and more fleeces. Honestly, the fleeces wasn't what sold me. It was the idea of achieving 100% completion. I'm just that kind of a player. So, deal struck Plimbo. Before heading to wrangle these witnesses, I felt before heading to wrangle these witnesses, I felt it was time to settle the score with Calamar. I started the battle on a high note, equipped with hearts aplenty, 485% bonus damage, and my demon buddies who were ready to rock and roll. But alas, ignorance of Calamar's attack patterns was my downfall. My death seemed to be caused by nothing? My best guess? I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, getting an instant death ticket to the afterlife. Unlucky indeed. Back in my cult, things were in shambles. Faith had bottomed out, hunger was rampant, and to top it all, Jorango Jorango Jorino Jorano was starting to act like a rebellious teenager. To keep the peace, I knew I had to whip up some grub. But in my rush, I made a grim error. The main ingredient in my feast was a fallen follower. Oopsie. Faith plummeted further. Desperate times called for desperate measures. I pondered over two potential traits to rescue my dire situation. Respect your elders or good die young. The former would add faith for every elderly follower in my cult, which would work given our aging demographic. But I finally settled on the latter, which gave me a faith boost when an elder was sacrificed, murdered, or consumed. I mean, who needs natural deaths anyway? To pump up faith levels ASAP, I threw a bonfire party showering blessings on everyone like the divine Oprah Winfrey. Lo and behold, my cult's faith skyrocketed all the way back to 100. To capitalize on this newfound optimism, I convinced everyone to contribute to my divine cause with all of their money. From near collapse to absolute prosperity, it's safe to say that my cult's comeback was nothing short of miraculous. Now, feeling rejuvenated and ready to rumble, it was time to confront Calamari once more. I decided to switch strategies and go for a curse run this time around. I opted for Ambrosia Plus card to amplify my curse attack damage by 1.5, followed by the Divine Curse card to slash my curse cost by 75%. My current equipped curse wasn't exactly stellar, but I had faith I'd find something better on my journey. 
Lo and behold, I bumped into Salios, an old foe. But the tables had turned. One of my demon pals almost dealt the killing blow single-handedly. I was left wondering if I had been underestimating these creatures all along. The encounter with Salios ended rather quickly, a stark contrast to our previous encounters. I next found an interesting tree statue demanding a 20 gold donation. In return, I got 5 gold. Yes, I paid 20 gold for 5 gold. This wasn't an investment, folks. This was a scam. To regain my losses, I liberated some of the loose change that was scattered around. Sadly, my trip ended prematurely due to a surprise defeat at the hands of a random minion, just when things were looking up. Back in my cult, I erected a prison for our dissenting members, intending to guide him back to the Righteous Path. I also managed to unlock the Fervor of the Righteous One, which allowed me to hold more fervor. Thorgel, one of our elder members, gave me a scare by napping in a rather lifeless manner. Worried about a natural death, I decided to perform a quick sacrifice ritual to prevent that. Through the sacrifice, I was able to unlock Might of the Devout Four, boosting my weapon strength even further. I also got my hands on the doctrine Return to the Earth, allowing me to construct a natural burial building. Now, when a follower died, I could recycle them into fertilizer. It is not handy. I performed the Glory Through Turmoil ritual for the sole reason that a follower had requested it. After all, I aim to please. Now, remember Jorgreno? He had been causing quite a stir, so I was eager to invite him to our new prison. But alas, I had forgotten his face. To make matters worse, he was asleep, denying me a glimpse into his rebellious eyes. Just as I spotted him sauntering towards the exit portal, he vanished into thin air before I could stop him. He had escaped. For now. Brushing off the escape, I decided to focus on the bigger picture. After ensuring my colt was content and well-fed, I ventured out again, eyeing Calamar's defeat. I came prepared with a freeze relic and a mighty hammer, backed by a bonus damage of 350%. Seemed like an easy win, right? If only my freeze relic had actually worked on Calamar. Despite my preparation, my slow attacking hammer and unfamiliarity with Calamar's moveset led to another defeat. In desperation, I made a snap decision to sacrifice a follower for another shot at Calamar. Spoiler alert, it was a colossal blunder. Back at the cult, I was given the choice between two new doctrines, one that would allow me to murder my followers, and another that would unlock the Ascend Follower ritual. The latter would raise a follower's spirit to a higher plane of existence, garnering instant loyalty from the remaining members. Even though the concept of murder was enticing, the Ascend Follower ritual seemed more practical, providing a fresh means of sacrificing more followers. Next on the agenda was a growing food crisis. My followers were hungry, and I was running low on substantial sustenance. I opted to prepare the ominously named Deadly Dish. This recipe had a high risk, high reward factor, a 75% chance of the instant death of a follower, but a 100% chance of yielding valuable resources. The gamble paid off in the form of a few stones, logs, and a bit of gold. Worth the risk? Yeah, I'd say so. This windfall allowed me to elevate my cult to level 4, the peak. This upgrade was crucial as it meant higher faith and devotion generation. I was confident this would lead to me quickly maxing out my weapons and prepare for the final challenge when the time came. However, the ongoing food crisis was taking its toll. The only ingredient left in my pantry was, well, follower meat. Despite the moral quandary, I served up what I had to stave off starvation. This move was met with understandable disdain and faith in me plummeting to zero. My follower, Gushian, initiated a revolt. I was determined not to let another follower slip away so easily. Gushin was swiftly sent to timeout and subjected to re-education. The process promised to be challenging, but I had faith in restoring Gushin's loyalty. In the throes of a faith crisis, I attempted the brainwashing ritual, but ran into a hitch. A lack of mushrooms. Noted, mushrooms were to be my farm's first priority. With a sufficient harvest, I hoped to have enough mushrooms for the remainder of the game and switch my focus to food later. With my cult in a state of chaos, I embarked on yet another attempt to challenge Calamar, which was less than successful. At my base, faith was non-existent, disease was spreading, and food was scarce, but all hope was not lost. I was, thankfully, flush with cash. I used my funds to purchase all the pricey fish from the fishermen. Here's to hoping this infusion of luxury substances would revitalize my followers, boosting their faith and easing their hunger simultaneously. The supposedly lavish fish meals had about as much impact on my followers as a rubber arrow does on a steel-clad knight, and their faith in me was hovering somewhere between who's that guy and oh, that guy. I found myself at crisis management levels of low. 
But just as I thought things couldn't get worse, they did. Because that's always how it works in my life, it seems. Tranity kicked the bucket. Famine one, my followers zero. No sooner had I buried Trinity that Fit Ramir decided to follow suit. Come on, man. No need to be a copycat. But he was dead, and therefore, I guess he didn't have to listen to me anymore. In this comedy of errors, I did have one yay moment. I upgraded my Might of the Devout to level 5, putting my weapons damage near Hulk smash level. But with the state of my followers, I was feeling less like an invincible hero and more like a babysitter who had lost control of a particularly chaotic birthday party. Facing another day of Despair Central, I hopped over to Anchor Deep again, armed with the hope that my lucky clover hadn't withered away. Bingo! I found a chest filled with tiny spiders and decided to embrace the beggars can't be choosers mantra. During my next bout with Calamar, I discovered that my current curse could be used as a sort of projectile bug zapper. Perfect, just when I thought my curse was about as useful as chocolate teapot. Despite my momentary choke that cost me an elderly follower, hey, I needed someone to blame for the blunder, I finally put Calamar in his place. Back at camp, my victory tour was met with an Oscar-worthy standing ovation. It seems I had gone from zero to hero, at least for a while. But then another follower succumbed to sickness. It was like my Cole had contracted a particularly nasty case of oops, I died syndrome. In a desperate bid to manage the food demands, I started a rather unconventional diet plan. Die and become the food supply. With fewer mouths to feed, maybe I could get a farm in shape and we could say goodbye to our cannibalistic ways. The bodies of the fallen chopped up. Because who has time or energy to dig graves when there's a farm to be saved? And honestly, who needs cross it when you can have a body chopping workout? After a rather intense round of what I'd like to call Scared Straight, Cole Edition, Gusian had come back to the fold. Welcome back, buddy. No hard feelings, right? I also unlocked the belief in absolution trait, so if I could just avoid sending anyone to jail for a day, we get a 10 faith bonus. Basically, stay out of trouble, kids, and we get cool stuff. At last, I managed to hold another fasting ritual, which was essentially my way of saying, surprise, we're doing intermittent fasting now. And surprise of all surprises, my mushroom garden was finally ready. There was nothing like the sight of homegrown hallucinogens to give you the hope for the future. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm all about letting the past die, but when I finally had the means to construct a proper resting place for my deceased follower who had yet to be put to the chopping block, even I had to admit it was about time. So leaving my crew to their chores, I dusted off my sea legs and set course for Silk Cradle, the land of Shimura. And boy was it a spider extravaganza. Sorry to anyone with A-legged phobias. As for Shimura, the guy couldn't bluff to save his life. Seriously, dude, even if you think you're going to lose, at least pretend to be a challenge. However, Shimura wasn't just a pushover. He had a knack of turning my followers into traitors. Yes, I ended up having up off my own loyal follower, Julna. Not cool, Shimura. As I continued, I met Filkalor, who to my surprise wasn't as tough as he looked. His bark was worse than his bite, and thanks to a blessing and disguise curse, I was able to defeat him at the small cost of an elderly follower. I also unlocked my final doctrine, Tax Enforcer. Who knew running a cult could feel so much like being a small town mayor? With my shiny new Sword of the Devout Six, I felt like a kid on Christmas morning. Finally, I was at max strength for my weapons. But all good things must come to an end, and it seemed like I'd hit a dead end in my power progression. Time to rely more on skill than firepower, I guess. I thought it might be a good idea to revisit Darkwood to deal with some pesky witnesses. You know, the kind of pest control one doesn't usually associate with nature walks, but honestly, after the challenge of Silk's Cradle, it was like a breath of fresh air. My walk in the park ended with a face-off against Agarese, who thought vanishing after summoning minions was a clever move. Cute. Post-victory, I had a choice, carry on crusading or return home. I decided to press on, hoarding as many resources as I could like a bargain hunter on Black Friday. Flush with new loot, I couldn't resist another leisurely stroll through Darkwood. Seriously, the place was like a discount store for resources. Failing the adventurous, I threw another follower into the sacrificial pit to unlock godly weapons. These things were like the Lamborghinis of the weapon world. Mix in a godly hammer and a golden fleece, and we're talking about an easy two-hit knockout. Noticing my faith meter was in the red, I decided it was time for some brainwashing. I mean, a loyalty boosting session. And guess what? I completely forgotten that was one of Sozo's quests. I scooted back to Sozo, who requested one last thing, a statue. Just what I need, more DIY projects. Still, I just needed the resources. Time to roll up my sleeves again. Having disposed of the witness in Hecate's territory, 
Using my curse to slow his roll, I unlocked a skill that turned my axe into a lethal boomerang. That's right, axe mastery, my new best friend. Couple that with dagger mastery, and we've got ourselves a late night TV infomercial for deadly versus IO weapons. Welcome to late game, folks. After a few more witness confrontations, the only witness left was in Silk's Cradle. But first, I had to deal with Shimura. I found some upgrades that cut my ritual costs and cooldowns in half. Seriously, where was this during my cult starting days? Deciding to streamline my cult, I ascended one of the elderly members. Oh, and I got hitched up with Gusian. Cult leader perks, am I right? Making him the tax collector seemed like a fair exchange. After all, marriage is about compromise, right? And why stop at one ritual? Let's get that devotion up with a ritual of enlightenment. With faith through the roof and resources aplenty, I figured it was time to upgrade the barracks. No more bunk bed malfunctions and pillow shortages. Sweet dreams for all. Dealing with the witnesses sure paid off, and my cult was thriving. Plenty of food, happy followers, and a healthy treasury. Feeling invincible, I decided it was time to pick a fight with Flinky and Knucklebones. Despite his higher difficulty rating, he was more of a pushover than Ratu had been. Clunko and Bob were no different. Apparently, my previous losses were just a string of bad luck. With my newfound wealth, I went on a shopping spree, buying every blueprint I could get my hands on. I mean, why not? I also held a resurrection ceremony, just to check that box. Back on the main quest, it was time to defeat Shimura. Vethar, a centipede boss, was next on my hit list. Despite his intimidating size, he was as easy to squash as his smaller cousins. On my way back, I ran into a, a creature without a name. Apparently, I was causing some ripples in the ether and morphing into an idol. Not sure what he's smoking, but something tells me our paths will cross again. Finally, I had enough resources to finish Sozo's statue, wrapping up his questline. After unlocking Dagger Mastery, I had pretty much exhausted all of the useful skills. Now, I just had to unlock them for achievement's sake. Medias' cave was interesting. Despite being a wealthy cult leader, Medias had the nerve to call me poor. The items had required golden bars, not your run-of-the-mill gold coins. And in a classic Medias twist, he asked for a sacrifice of four followers for an emblem. Well, good riddance to the ones with low faith in the elderly, I guess. Back at base, I got my cult working on a second refinery, ready to churn out those precious gold bars. Talk about Medias' touch. Back in Silk Cradle, I met an unexpected friend. Meet Shrummy, the turtle who had a thing for knuckle bones. Bring it, buddy. But when Shimura spoiled the party, turning two of my followers against me like a pet owner putting down a rabid dog, I had to take them out. I could practically taste my revenge against Shimura. Horror this. A lightning fast scorpion was the last obstacle between me and Shimura. But compared to the drama that had preceded him, he was just another item on the to-do list. I took him down without breaking a sweat, even without stacks on golden fleets. With my path cleared, I upgraded the demon summoning platform, allowing me to summon three demons for a run. The final showdown was upon us. The fight was a whirlwind of adrenaline and close calls. One quick, unexpected attack from a Shimura tied me down. Sacrificing a follower, I came back smarter and more cautious, using my heavy axe attacks to gradually chip away at Shimura's health. I won't lie, it was intense. But on my very first attempt, Shimura was no more. All the bishops had been defeated. But there was one final encounter. The unchained god of death himself. The one who had bestowed these powers upon me. The one who waits. He asked me to return the crown to its rightful owner. We'll see about that. Returning to my cult, I did a quick round of rituals. With most of them off cooldown and still a decent amount of tasks left to 100% the game, it was worth it. And then, it was time for the final face off against the one who waits. Fasten your seatbelt folks, it's about to get wild. For that though, we're diving back in a silk cradle, where our adversaries of witness were more than ready to silence. Onwards and upwards to the witness in silk cradle. This guy didn't stand a chance, like swatting a fly. And what's a victory without a post-battle celebration? Time to school Shroomy in a game of knuckle bones. They say he's one of the best players around, but honestly, I'm starting to think it's all luck. Or maybe they never played against yours truly, the knuckle bones champ. Speaking of wrapping things up, I presented the last bunch of eyes to Plimbo. That's his quest done and dusted. Following that, I embarked on a, on a whirlwind tour of all the discovered areas, scavenging for any leftover blueprints. But enough faffling about, the one who waits awaits. In our first meeting, curiosity got the better of me and I accepted his offer of a sacrifice, just to see what would happen. Spoiler alert, I got sacrificed. Quickly. Violently. Game over. Now my finest moment. Round 2 was decidedly less suicidal. I declined his offer of a sacrifice and we jumped into the final boss battle. Now this is a different ballgame altogether. There are no minions to slaughter, so my beloved Golden Fleece is pretty much useless here. 
I've got a choice of three weapons and three curses. If there's an axe or a dagger, it's mine, no questions asked. The dagger's special move is practically tailor-made for large, cumbersome bosses. But before we go up against the one who waits, we've got to deal with his heavies. First up is Ball, who runs at you fist first. Then there's Aim, a softer touch but with a penchant for projectiles. Thankfully, she spends a lot of time standing still, so it's easy to take her down. The main event, the fight with the one who waits, follows the same pattern. A lot of projectiles, but once you get the rhythm, it's a walk in the park. Then things get a little weird. He pulls you down to fight with his floating eyeballs. I'm not making this up. My dagger special isn't as effective against these airborne ocular oddities, but once you get a hang of the fight's flow, it's honestly one of the easier parts of the game. All you need is patience and a healthy love for battling floating eyeballs, as I do. I want to emphasize the convenience of this last battle against the one who waits. Every time I failed, the game reverted back to my previous save. Time didn't move forward and I didn't need to worry about managing my cult. I could just keep diving right back into the battle refining my strategy with each attempt. Once I had the pattern down, I realized that the battle against Tekka was actually more challenging than this. But as the saying goes, if at first you don't succeed, try try again. And try I did until victory was mine. Picture this, the one who waits, now on his knees, begging for mercy. I had to decide whether to end his existence or spare him. But then a thought struck me. What could be more humiliating than for a once powerful god to become a lamb, a follower of the very one who defeated him? And that's the path I chose. No quick exit for you, buddy. You're in it for the long haul. Following his defeat, I ascended the throne amidst the cheers of my followers. I was now the one and only god of this realm. The game was completed, the story concluded. But my journey wasn't quite over. There were still a few achievements and unlocks left to gather. Back at camp, the self-sustaining cycle continued. The worst case scenario required me to occasionally perform a ritual to keep things in order. Other than that, I could focus on the remaining challenges of the game. For the sake of time, I'll speed through the final bits of the journey. Oh, and a little side note. The one who waits, once a god, was now my eternal follower, tirelessly worshipping me through the day and night. The irony is delicious, isn't it? Just when I thought everything was tied up, I was met by a new task. As a new god of death, I was entrusted with putting down the rest of the bishops, who were trapped in a sort of purgatory. This meant revisiting each realm and facing the bishops and their mini bosses again. These new battles were against upgraded versions of the mini bosses, who were stronger and faster, but not enough to pose a real challenge. On a feeding one, I was awarded a god's tier. This opened up a roulette with a mysterious being, where I could earn an emblem fragment, a new necklace, a new commandment, or a new follower form. This was part of the journey that I had to repeat multiple times to unlock all the fleeces and follower forms. The new commandments allowed me to choose alternative doctrines, which was a cool addition but not required for 100%. So without much interest in new doctrines, I carried on. Without any significant challenges on my way, I quickly defeated Leshy, reducing him to a mere mortal. The game then granted me an interesting option, to take him on as one of my followers. I relished in the thought of having each bishop under my command by the end of the game, so of course, I took up that offer. Leshy's defeat came with a new quest, to find his eye, a task that would unlock another relic. For the sake of completion, I took on the task, venturing back into the land of Leshy, and soon enough had his eye in my possession. The next on my hit list was Hecate. Everyone's favorite boss, right? Before that though, I encountered a new mechanic, Purgatory. Purgatory runs, accessible only once per in-game day, came with challenges centered around the type of fleeces I used. They came in two varieties, a regular dungeon run or a boss rush. The boss rush, which I could potentially complete faster, seemed more appealing than my 100th dungeon run. I was also tasked with an achievement, completing an entire row in Purgatory, or in other words, completing all the challenges associated with a specific fleece. Six challenges in total, each one harder than the previous. But I was also gifted with a game-changing reward. Enough fragments to unlock a new fleece, the Fleece of the Berserker. With this, my weapon dealt 10 times the amount of damage it normally does, enabling me to annihilate almost any mob instantly. The catch? I couldn't be resurrected, and I would die in only one hit. Every run had to be completed in only one attempt. But with my expertise with the Golden Fleece, the Berserker seemed like a natural upgrade. For the rest of the game, I decided to stick with the Fleece of the Berserker and bulldoze my way through the remaining objectives as swiftly as possible. The first boss rush was a walk in the park, containing only many bosses. These runs were a reliable source of much needed god tiers. Gradually, the boss rush became more and more challenging, introducing bishop fights and stronger mini bosses. 
sometimes up to three to four mini-bosses between each bishop fight. And each boss run ended with a fight against the one who waits. The thought of going through all of that without taking a single hit was daunting. But stick around, you'll see how I managed it. With my newfound power, I charged ahead and demolished everything in my path on the way to Hecate. Our second encounter was short-lived. My hours of practice against him had paid off, and I was easily able to dispatch him. His defeat marked the completion of another quest. Then, it was time to square off against Calamar. My old friend Plimbo popped up once again, bearing the news that the witnesses had of course returned. Yes, another repeat objective. A new obstacle was also emerging at this point. Each door to the bishops required a sacrifice, a follower with high devotion. The final door, leading to Shimura, demanded a follower with level 10 devotion, something I hadn't even achieved at this point in the game. I had to resort to resurrecting one of my highest devotion followers, Theon, my very first follower from the start of the game. I also went ahead and set up a confession booth to make it a point to bless Theon each day, ensuring he reached level 10 devotion when the time came. To be on the safe side, I also granted him a necklace that doubled his lifespan to make sure he didn't pass away before I needed him. At this stage, I had become an expert at purgatory runs. I discovered that the dagger ability allowed me to annihilate any bishop, including the tough Hecate, almost instantly. I memorized Hecate's starting move and rendered him completely ineffective, making him no match for me, not even posing a threat of taking any damage. Upon my onslaught, Calamar quickly fell and Theon was prepared for the ultimate sacrifice. The only significant challenge that remained was Shimura. However, there was a ticking clock. The purgatory runs were bound by the cycle of day and night, and if I didn't clear them before completing all my runs, I'd end up in a holding pattern, waiting for the day to roll over. That sounded mind-numbingly boring. More importantly, if I wasn't fast enough, I'd exceed the 100-day threshold, thereby failing the challenge. So it was time to buckle down and handle these runs with the utmost seriousness. The biggest threat at this stage was the one who waits. Mainly, I'd attribute this to the simple fact that I didn't have as much time to practice against him as I had the others. But every other fight had become a breeze, allowing me to consistently reach him and learn more about his patterns. Over time, the most challenging part of the fight, his eyes became manageable. Once you understand their attack pattern, you can swoop in and strike right after they're done. Most of the bullets in the stage were fairly slow moving, barring a few exceptions. So once you get the hang of things, it's not as dangerous. However, it wouldn't hurt to have a bit more security. I discovered that one of the relics on offer actually granted you hearts. While using the Berserker Fleece, the game stripped away any blue hearts after leaving a room and disabled the hard tarot cards, but they overlooked the heart granting relic. With this little loophole, I could survive a few hits during my Berserker runs. The real challenge was finding the right relic. Given that there were over 30 relics on the game, the odds weren't exactly in my favor. However, a relic always shows up as a reward option in Purgatory after defeating a boss. By selecting the relic each time, I ensured it wouldn't reappear, allowing me to cycle through the relics until I got the one I needed. The relic only offered a 50% chance to grant me the heart that I wanted, but that seemed like decent odds to me, especially since I could slowly recharge it and give it another shot. The looming dread of Purgatory, which initially felt insurmountable with its relentless gauntlet of bosses, became surprisingly manageable and thankful to the bounty of relics bestowed upon me. Before fully vanquishing Purgatory, however, I, su I succeeded in defeating Shimura. All that remained in this chapter was to claim his relic, vanquish the witness residing there, and the major objectives in the postgame would largely be wrapped up. I then noticed that I was missing an emblem, as a mysterious being had run out of rewards to give me. After a quick online search, I discovered there was a secret side quest. It turns out that there's a mysterious figure in the docks at night that would provide me with emblem fragments, for a price. In the end, I had to give him some fish, sacrifice three of my followers, and tragically bid farewell to my dear friend Ratu in order to fully finish all the fleeces. Sorry Ratu, but I know you would have wanted this. You would have wanted me to achieve 100% completion on my achievements. At this point, having exhausted all the follower skins I could get from the mysterious being, I had to look this one up as well. There were a few miscellaneous tasks to complete like cooking poop, catching butterflies, and praying at a statue, but I also realized there were DLC follower forms that required purchasing. This meant shelling out 10 bucks just to get all the follower forms and unlocking the achievement. Admittedly, I wish I had waited for the Steam Summer Sale, but what's done is done. Another achievement crossed off my checklist. I also discovered that I had special necklaces which allowed me to resurrect their two bodyguards that accompanied the one who waits. If I brought them both on a run and encountered their mother, I could complete the quest to get all the relics in the game. Such a heartwarming reunion. By day 80, luck was on my side and I had a surplus of hearts going to the final fight with the one who waits. With the excitement of completion bubbling within me, I dove into the final fight. Upon emerging victorious, I unlocked the achievement for completing the entire row in Purgatory. 
After swiftly finishing off the last witness, I unlocked the final fleece. My final achievement, unlocking all the follower forms, was obtained by catching the final firefly, allowing me to unlock the achievement, Godhood. I had finally done it. The grind was over. I had accomplished 100% completion and Cult of the Lambs in under 100 days. To celebrate, I chose to ascend our good buddy, the one who waits, Damien had time for his final rest. Just kidding. I immediately resurrected him. As the old saying goes, you're my follower for life, and I won't ever let you go. Well, folks, there you have it. We've journeyed together through trials and tribulations, boss battles, and secret side quests. We've uncovered hidden gems, exploited system quirks, and even said goodbye to some of our beloved followers. We've fought, we've laughed, and we've grinded, and in the end, we've achieved godhood. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth, wild ride through Cult of the Lambs. It's been an absolute blast guiding you through this 100% completion in under 100 days. Remember, whether you're a seasoned gamer or just starting out, the journey is just as important as the destination. This game, like many others, is full of surprises and it always pays to explore every nook and cranny. 